Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Um, I remember when I was in fourth grade, um, I failed my first test. It was a spelling test. And uh, I can remember how I felt that day. Her name was Miss McDowell. She was a first year teacher there at the school I grew up in. And so we met in a library. We didn't have our own classroom. We didn't have anything and, and because our school was growing so much. And, and I remember that very first test I took, I failed miserably. And very honestly, it was her fault because it was her first year teacher. And it just, you know, <laughs> that's what I thought at least. But what happened to me is began something that I didn't even know was going on in my journey. Because over that year, I struggled in spelling all year long. And over that year, I began to develop a pattern in my journey of shame, that something was wrong with me, that something was wrong with me that I couldn't spell like the other kids. And what happened was, is a journey that began that over the last 35 to 40 years of my growth, that failure has become a part of my journey. And you know, organizations and schools and churches, uh, they all have missions, and, and we all have those. And every human being on earth has a mission. God created us that way. Uh, churches, schools, businesses. And I'm one of those guys, I love strategizing. I love building strategy. I love missions. I love to achieve mission. I love to celebrate mission. But the thing I learned over a couple years ago, and it happened really three years ago in my journey, is that I have a dark side to my personality. I do. I have a shadow. I have a sinful heart. <laughs> And I still struggle with the flesh. Now, just in case you're about to judge me, okay? Because I know some of you, you start hearing that, and you're going, oh, I knew it. <laughs> I want to let you in on a little secret. Everybody has a dark side. There's not a person in this room that doesn't have a dark side. There's something in your journey, even right now, some of you are still living in your shadow. Our lives and the lives of the people we hang out with our churches, our businesses, what happens is because we've never dealt with that dark side of our, of our personality and our creation and how God's created us, is that we drift in the pursuit of something either unworthy or very, very dark. And to give in to our dark side, our shadow side, should be one of our greatest fears because we were created for a mission. God created us with potential. In fact, we believe that when God created you, he knew he had a certain mission for your life. And so when you were born, God had a certain potential that he had for you. See, we learned that, that God gives different talents to different people. But here's what we know. Even nine months, if you go back and read Jeremiah chapter one, that God created every one of us in the womb. And when he created us, he already had in mind the potential that he wanted us to achieve. And so we have all these different gifts and talents and the things that God has given us. But what happens is, as we grow, I'm going to be 48 years old this year, we look at our potential and we know that we have a potential. But somewhere along the way, when we begin to evaluate our journey, what we realize is, here's our potential and here's our reality. And what's left there in between is what's called, as I throw that down, it's what we call here the frustration gap because we're frustrated. And so we see our potential and we see how God's created us, but somewhere along the journey, what we've done is that we have settled for less than our potential. You see, in fourth grade, it started for me. In fourth grade, when I 
embrace shame, that something was wrong with me, then I began to settle over the years and not live to the potential that God created me to. And what I call this is the failure gap. Because see, when we get frustrated and we don't know what to do, and our reality is where we are, we begin to look for substitutes to fill that gap. Because all of us were designed for a mission. And here's what I know. If we don't pursue the mission in which God designed us for, gifted us for, we will find a substitute. Because we can't live in the absence of purpose. We're going to be tempted, tempted to drift on autopilot, which is where some of you are today. That somewhere along the way, you bought the lie that you're never going to live up to your potential. And so you just kicked it into autopilot and you're letting your life center around something that's unworthy or something that's selfish or something that's dark, a shadow. I mean, do you ever feel like a failure? And don't answer that out loud, okay? And don't answer it for your spouse. <laughs> do you ever feel like a failure? I mean, what does God really think of your failures? Have you ever stopped to think about that? I wonder if you're like me, that you've stopped at times and I can remember so clearly almost eight, nine years ago that I would sit in my office and I would think I should be further along than where I am. I should be a better money manager. I should, I should be better than what I, and it was all that shame and all that stuff that kept coming into my journey from years ago all the way back to fourth grade. But I can remember failing that test and there was something wrong with me. And even when I turned 40, I began to ask, I should be further along than where I am. You know, there are a lot of reasons why God shouldn't have called me and shouldn't have called you either, amen? But God doesn't wait until we're perfect, does he? I mean, you think of the scripture, the whole scripture. When I started thinking about this about five or six months ago, and I started looking at my story of failure and, and all the things that, that, that God has allowed me to go through and some of the things I've created by my own decisions, I look at scripture and what I realize about scripture is scripture is a book full of men and women who have failed miserably and God has responded to them. Think about that. The whole scripture is men who are flawed and failed and God responded to them. In fact, you remember the guy named Abraham? He lied. Remember his wife, Sarah? She laughed at God. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit. John Mark was rejected by Paul. Timothy had ulcers. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. <gasps> I know. Amos, you remember him? Only training he had, he was just, he was a school of fig tree pruning. That's all he had. He didn't have education. Jacob was a liar. David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Jesus was too poor. Isaiah preached naked. Aren't you glad I don't? <laughs> and y'all gripe about my preaching sometimes? It's biblical. I could. <laughs> Got my fig leaves, okay? Um, Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. <laughs> John was self-righteous. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer, and so was Moses and David. Don't forget that. Miriam was a gossip. <laughs> Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out and suicidal. John the Baptist was a loudmouth. Martha was a worry wart. Mary may have been lazy. Samson had long hair. Noah got drunk and naked. There it is again. <laughs> oh, did I mention Moses had a short fuse and so did Paul and so did Peter and most of us in here? Oh yeah, I'm speaking of Peter. He denied Christ three times. Aren't you glad God doesn't hire and fire like your boss? Isn't that good? See, the whole scripture is full of men and women who, regardless of financial gain or loss, regardless of prejudice or, or, or partiality, that, that God used people and he used them in the midst of their failure and God redeemed them and, and he made them whole because, they, listen to me, and you need to listen to this. You're gonna hear me say this all through this series. Failure is never final as long as love exists. 
Failure is never final as long as love exists. And listen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Failure is never final as long as love exists. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, failure is never final when love is present because Jesus died on the cross for you and I. And so the failure we think we're going through, God wants to redeem that and use that in our journey. And I'm gonna tell you, be honest, one of the motivating factors for this series, for me to be in here today to talk to you about this, is my own struggle with the dark side and my own struggle with failure. And I've asked people to pray for me this last week because I've put this together, I've struggled. And listen, I'm not gonna confess all my sins to you because that wouldn't be healthy for me or for you. But I'm gonna get very personal in this series because I've struggled with this up until 45 years old, until God allowed me to hit a wall so that he could begin to rebuild my identity in my journey. You see, my own journey is, is three and a half years ago, four years ago, I discovered an unhealthy compulsion to succeed because I thought something was wrong with me. And no matter how much success I had, no matter how much I tried, I still had bouts of depression and then eventually led to burnout. There were a time in my life where I thought working 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week would fix what was going on in my journey, but God finally allowed me to hit that wall. There was something in me that I could go home after an afternoon of preaching a message like today, and I would go home and I would critique the message. There's nothing wrong with that, but what I would eventually do is begin critiquing Edward, that something is wrong with me, and that's why I quit going home on Sunday afternoons, and I would just stay here so I wouldn't have to face that shadow that was in my journey. And ultimately, those frustrations that I was walking through during that season, it bled over into my life and into my family and the people that I love the most. And it began to come to a point for me that God let me hit that wall because he loved me enough to allow me to go there. And I learned that there's a paradox of sorts that exists in some of the lives of most people who've ever experienced great failures and those insecurities and those inferiorities that the very way that God has gifted us and that potential, I've always known I could talk, amen? My daddy said, I picked that up. I didn't talk till I was three and he said I hadn't shut up since, amen? I know God's gifted me. I know God gifted me very greatly. But that very gift that God gave me, what happens is in failures, I found that that gift is working out of the shadow side. And the very gift that God's given for many of us, what we don't realize that many of us are often those same issues that lead to our failure when we don't face that dark side. The paradox can be seen in modern day politicians. They're gifted to do what they do, but there's a dark side they haven't dealt with. If you go back and look at history and historical figures, and then you look at the Bible and you see the leaders in the Bible that these guys, that God created them and yet they would use their gifts and the way God created them out of that darkness that led to incredible failure. So this whole series, I just wanna tell you, is based on some assumptions. And I know you're not supposed to make assumptions and all that talk and all that stuff, but listen, we gotta start somewhere. So let me tell you some assumptions that I've made in writing this series. Number one, everyone suffers to some degree of personal dysfunction. Everybody, there's not anybody in this room that doesn't. But number two, I believe that personal dysfunction in one form or another can often serve as a driving force behind an individual's desire to achieve success or meaning. Now, sometimes we'll let that dysfunction drive us. And number three, many people are not aware of the dark side of their personalities. As Neil T. Anderson used to say, people don't know they're deceived because they're deceived. And so for many of us, we've not had our eyes opened. We've not seen that. We've not done the work to do that. And as I said a while ago, many of us, the very thing that the characteristics that God has given us to succeed or to become leads often to a shadow side that cripple us once we become leaders or get what we think we want. There's there's a bunch of young men who struggle with pornography and masturbation, and they think marriage will fix that. And what we know is, is that if that habit and that, that darkness that you're functioning out of that side of that little boy that's just wanting love, and you're trying to get it in a way that's unholy, what'll happen is you think marriage is gonna solve that. It's not, because you're gonna carry that dark side right on in, it's gonna become full blown until it kills you. 
You see, learning the dark side and the dysfunctions in us allows us to address those. And not at a surface level, but to dig down and find those things underneath. And scripture has so much to say. Again, the whole Bible is full of men and women who were colossal failures. And yet it was God's response to them. And God's response was love and grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. All through scripture we see this. And yet here we are today, we're still struggling with that. You see, somewhere in the church along the way, I know that some people believe, well, that's just the devil. The old devil's getting them. Y'all remember that? Where everything was the devil's fault. He got so much credit. (laughs) I mean, if somebody failed, well, the devil won another one. You know, I don't want to make a lot of demonic activity. I believe we have an enemy and he's crafty. But I don't think we can just easily dismiss that everything's demonic. Because when it comes to church and it comes to to us burning out in the Christian world and us thinking we're doing the right thing and all that, you know, it almost is altruistic, the desire, because we want to expand the kingdom, right? I know for me, it it almost fit right into the lies I was believing because if I was going to be successful, I got to win people to Jesus, man. I got to disciple them, man. There are people going to hell. I can't take a day off. I can't take a lunch break. You might go to hell if I take a lunch break. Not really. You'll go to hell if you don't know Jesus, okay? Not because I don't take a lunch break. But it became real for me. And you see, in either case, in the ministry world or just every ordinary life, the dysfunctions that drive us usually go undetected and unnoticed until it's too late. Because pain is a part of our life. And I'm not talking this morning about the pain of sin, If you sin, there are consequences to your sin. And we're going to talk about that in this series. What I'm talking about is just the pain of life. And when people suffer in any way, it's human nature to ask, why did this happen? You ever ask that? I have. In fact, I remember an argument I had with God almost 20-something years ago on a highway between Corsicana and Waco, Texas, where I just yelled at God, why me, God? 13 years I've served you, and this is what you do? You ever had one of those? I did. And I've asked those questions more than once in my life, and I think part of that is just part of our DNA. When these questions begin to arise, though, the courageous and insightful step is to make a searching and fearless assessment and to assign the appropriate responsibility. See, I struggle with this whole idea of shame and and success that I was responsible for everybody. I was responsible for everyone. And it began to create this function in my journey that I did not have the insight and the courage to deal with because it was working for me, but yet it wasn't leading to the joy and the things that God promised me. See, the problem is many of us lack one or the other, insider courage, or we lack both. And so what we tend to do is we become blame sponges or blame throwers. You ever been around those kind of people? See, blame sponges in times of conflict, those people just accept responsibility for everything. It's my fault. I'm sorry. They just take responsibility for everything. And they may not have done anything or they may not have done much of anything, but they're just going to take this, just get the pain over with. I did it. It's okay. I can't stand the tension. I did it. Let's just move on. Those are blame sponges. And then there's those blame throwers. You ever been around those guys? They're fun. They impulsively defend themselves at all costs, at point of any target, especially those poor souls that are blame sponges. They'll throw it all and let them soak it up. And this pathological dance happens in marriages and churches and offices and small groups. In fact, the more it happens, the harder it is to change the pattern of accusation and acquiesce. Is we just kind of accept it. Well, that's just the way it is. And the pattern becomes more comfortable because it's predictable. Well, this guy's going to blame, this guy's going to accept But when it comes to pain, I'm telling you where we are, is that Americans don't do well with it because when we start going through pain, you know what we do? We look for a quick fix. God, get me out of this. Isn't that our first prayer? God, stop the pain. God, whatever's going on here, I don't want to do this. I'm tired of this. I'm ready. So we look for quick, obvious answers. And if we don't do that, then we blame God for not protecting us or providing it in the way we expected. But yet I believe we got to look at a little closer to kind of get under that because you may be able to identify the surface problems, 
for instance, that resistance from your employer, or maybe you're the employer and your employees aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Or maybe the workload is too heavy and that's what you think's driving, or your spouse's anger, or the sin of a child that brought shame and guilt on the whole family. And we see those things and we begin to do that, or the lack of funds, you kind of get the picture. But one layer under, when you get one layer under of what's going on, the truth is, when pain happens, we feel out of control. We feel out of control. And we believe, honestly, that we've got to be in control, happy, and successful. Because you bought the lie that when you got saved, Jesus is just going to fix everything. He is going to be happy, and everything's going to come your way, and your banking accounts are going to be full, and drive a Tahoe, and have a white picket fence. Nothing wrong with that, okay? If you have a white picket fence, that's fine, Okay. But the perception is we're out of control. And the more we feel out of control, the more our anxiety grows. And just under the surface, we're wrestling with a far bigger, deeper, more threatening danger that we believe there's something wrong with us, that we're weak and worthless. And our greatest fear is that other people are gonna find out that truth. And so therefore, we live from the frustration gap to the failure gap because we're constantly living in the shame. See, when we suffer, we seldom see the reason for the pain. That's why you gotta go through it. As David said just a few weeks ago on that Celebrate Recovery message, our, whether it's our sin, because even sin's hard to connect the dots, but it's a little bit easier sometimes. Y'all remember Job? How was that for connecting the dots in the Old Testament? When it all fell apart and that brother didn't do a thing. He loved Jesus and it fell apart. See, sometimes it's hard to connect the dots when you're in it, but sometimes it's even harder when sin, when we've chosen to be there. And we're almost like the disciples, where, where their, their conclusion, when, when they got in that boat and they're going across the Sea of Galilee and, and the storm comes up and Jesus is up there just taking a nap. And the disciples panic and they wake him up. And you know what their first conclusion was after being with Jesus all that time? Lord, don't you care? <laughs> don't you care? Isn't that amazing how quick we'll run there when pain comes in? You see, I think for pain, it's a reality. God never promised us a pain-free life. If you were told that when you received Jesus, they lied to you. What God did promise is a meaningful life. As he takes and lets us go through some things as we're about to see. You know, the Apostle Paul was a spiritual leader that had no illusions about the fact that God was going to allow him to go through pain, not only to shape him, but to give him a platform for his ministry. Saul, who later became Paul, was on the road to Damascus, if you remember that. And he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and the Lord blinded him. And then he told him, he said, you're going to go to Ananias. And when you go to Ananias, he's going to lay hands on you, and he's going to pray over you, and you'll get your sight back. And so Ananias hears about that this guy, Paul, who's now Paul, used to be Saul, that he's coming to his house, and Ananias is going, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. In fact, he's so denied that God had to basically send Ananias a, a, a vision to say, look, dude, I'm sending this for this. In fact, look at it at Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. He says, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And so Ananias is like, okay. So he goes, lays hands on Paul, has this moment where the scales drop off his eyes. He hangs out with him and he begins to do ministry and he starts with winning people all over, church planner. In fact, two-thirds of the New Testament was written by this guy who used to hunt people down and kill Christians. And then all of a sudden, we, he comes to this area called the Corinth Church. Now, if you know anything about the Corinth Church, they were probably the most jacked up church in the New Testament. You think we're messed up? These guys were messed up. And so Paul was going to them. He started going to write them. He wrote them actually three letters. We have two of them. And, and in one of his letters, he was letting them know about his resume. And he was letting them know that the experiences that he's traveled around. Listen, guys, I know what I'm talking about. I want you to see my resume. And, and so we have that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. Look at this resume. Here's what Paul said. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and the day in the open 
open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, from fellow Jews, from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city, in the country, danger at sea, and the danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. There it is again. And besides everything else, I face daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, can you imagine that you're looking for the new pastor at Summit Heights Fellowship and you get that resume? Okay, let me, let me sum it up for you. The guy was beaten on the job. First of all, I'd want to know why. Dude, you got beat on the job? Your boss beat you up? What, what is up? How about this one? Face the death penalty. You know, I don't think you hire guys off death row to become your pastor, right? Okay, let's keep going. He was stoned. Okay, I'm not talking stoned, okay? He, <laughs> thank you. Um, he had rocks thrown at him, so he was probably a little disfigured. He wasn't pretty man. He was shipwrecked and left at sea with the sharks. I mean, that was the original shark week. Amen? He didn't sleep, couldn't keep a job, had to move around all the time. Real stable guy, right? Went hungry, went thirsty, was naked, didn't have any clothes. I mean, come on, let's be honest. If you got his resume, you know what we'd do with that. Oh, yeah, right. But we'll call you, right? You know, in that same letter Paul was writing to the current church, here's a guy that suffered greatly, gone through pain. And God was molding him. And we know the end of the story. Paul didn't know the end of the story at that point. But see, God had given Paul a stunning vision of heaven, something that only angels saw, something that only angels saw in that. And, and Paul got a little bit prideful. So to keep Paul from thinking he was a little bit privileged, to humble him, now listen to this, God allowed Satan to give him a thorn in the flesh. See, some of you believe that God would never do something like that to you. Well, you got to wrestle with that passage right there. You got to wrestle with that. Because God gave him a thorn in the flesh. He allowed the enemy to give him a thorn in the flesh. And we don't even know what it is. Theologians have speculated for years what it is. I remember sitting at a table one time and a lady across from me looked at me and said, I know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. He was a homosexual. I nearly came over the table. If it wasn't for my wife digging her nails into my leg under the table, I probably wouldn't have been able to marry her because it was at a family event. <laughs> we don't know what it was, but we do know this. It was painful, and Paul asked three times, God, would you remove it? Three times. And God answered him with a no and an explanation. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Look what God says. He says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect, perfect in weakness. You see, at some point in your pain, here's what God wants to do. He wants to take this painful experience and he wants to round your story out to grace. For us to understand, yeah, I know it's painful, but my grace is sufficient for you. And God's reasoning for Paul was enough. In fact, look what he says as he goes on in this passage. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can I just tell you, some of you guys are stuck in your failure and you've never rounded out your story to grace. You see, if you paraphrase Paul's perspective, life's most defining moments are usually painful experiences. Some of you are stuck there. And you're just stuck in that painful experience. And you've so far stuffed it back in your journey that it's become this long shadow that everything is dependent upon you not dealing with that. Yet God's most defining moments in our journey usually come through painful experiences. And when we encounter pain, we often default to those coping cells because we're all imitating somebody. You realize that. You're either imitating Christ or you're imitating somebody in your journey. And imitation is not bad. It's just you might be imitating the wrong person. It takes perception, courage, and help to create new habits. And we grow by design, not by default. Just because you're sitting in these chairs doesn't mean you're growing. There's a design that God wants you to grow through your painful experiences so that you will go on to look more like him. 
And the more you push that back and the more you push that away, the longer that journey is gonna be and the darker it's gonna get. And to realize that those painful incidents are actual rocket boosters that can propel you to a higher orbit than you've ever dreamed or imagined. That God wants to have those, he allows those painful experiences because he knows the potential. I know the plans I created for you. I know what I have for you, says the Lord. And so as life begins to happen and post painful experiences and we settle, yet what God wants to do is he says, look, I know the potential. You're, you're a five talent guy and you're settling for two. You're settling for one. And yet God says, I know what I created you to be. And when we don't live up to that, there becomes that frustration gap and even that failure gap that we live in that shadow. You see, when we experience heartaches and difficulties, no matter what the source, we need to look beneath it to identify those root causes from a human and a divine experience and perspective. And that requires courage. It might even admit that you're intellectually wrong. Some of you are so brilliant that you can outthink God. <laughs> and an analysis of your soul, you might have to admit you're morally flawed. You're relationally controlling. And you may be victims of other people's demands. Yes, you may have been sexually molested. And yes, you may have a story where you didn't do anything wrong, abandonment. But listen to me, what we do have the responsibility, no matter what has happened to us, is to respond with integrity, wisdom, forgiveness, and love. Because here's what I learned three and a half years ago. We can't control people. Can't. You can't control what they say or they do. But the only thing we can control is what we say, what we do, and our responsibility in that. Quite often, an accurate appraisal shows us that a dream has died. You see, I have enough failure in my journey that I had a guy tell me about six months ago, Ed, you're an expert in failure. If anybody ought to be an expert, you're the guy. Why aren't you talking about this? And very honestly, part of it was I didn't want to talk about it. Because I'd built a whole life trying to overcome that, creating this long shadow so that nobody would really know until I couldn't do it anymore. You see, when we suffer any kind of loss, we grieve. And honestly, Americans are not good at it. Because somewhere along the journey, we believe God abandoned Israel and chose us. And he promised us that we would have a happy life. And yet he hasn't. What he has promised is a meaningful life. And it does involve pain. And the necessary response to that is grief. You see, as we grieve, we choose to forgive those who hurt us. But listen to me, it's huge. Some of you need to hear this. You also choose to forgive yourself. And can I just say this very honestly? If you're struggling with that, if you're having a hard time forgiving maybe someone else, or maybe just yourself, then you need to go deeper into God's grace. Because God's grace is he's forgiven you that you're fully loved. You are fully forgiven. And I know some of you don't believe that. That doesn't change the truth. That at the cross of Jesus Christ, all past, present, and future sins are forgiven. And yet some of us won't let go. See, that's why some of you need to round your story out to grace because you're stuck, you're, you're a blame thrower, you're a blame sponge. And when pain comes along, you just retreat or you just throw things. You see, when we let go of our tight grip of control and hold on what we're responsible for handling, we realize we're not as powerful as we thought. And that brings a new level of humility and new levels of trust that we learn that he's God and we're not. You know, in all this, I think for me, what I've realized in my journey is God has used some of the most powerful moments of my journey and the most difficult relationships not to destroy me, but to create something beautiful. And it's taken me almost 45 years to realize that and not try to overcome that. And the more honest and secure I am in the grace that I'm fully loved and fully forgiven, I've stopped controlling people sometimes. 
I'm so much better than I was four years ago. And the amazing thing is, is that, man, there were some people when I came back that were so excited. Oh, Ed, you're on fire. But as I've lived out my healing over the last four years, what happens is when, when change comes and you get comfortable with who you are, that you're fully loved and fully forgiven, people get uncomfortable with it because they're really used to being told what to do and how to feel. And over time, some of you have gotten uncomfortable with me because it's the first time in my journey, I'm at peace with who I am. And I'm at peace with who God is. And I'm fully loved and fully forgiven. And I don't have to lead out of a shame anymore to cover up something, to prove something. Because I'm a son of God. Fully loved and fully forgiven, knowing my potential, know I'm good at what I'm doing. And I don't need the approval anymore. I still struggle. I'd be lying if I didn't say that. I totally struggle. Well, what I found is that there's a rich, authentic relationship based on honesty, trust, and love for the first time in my journey. For the last three and a half years, there's been real change. And I'm telling you, it's one of the most powerful things for me. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some men and women in Scripture that's failed, and you're going to hear more about my story. And again, I'm not going to tell you the gory details. There's a group of men, some of them I'm looking at, they're my elders in this room and some guys around the country that know my story. They know all my stuff and you don't need to know it. Okay? Anymore and I need to know yours. Don't look at me that way. So let me close with a few thoughts. And I want to say this, first of all, sin's different. Okay? Sometimes we go through pain and we never ask for it. But listen, there are consequences to your sin. But if we believe God uses sin to shape us, there's, there's this idea that going, oh, well, if God's forgive me anyway, then God's going to shape me and make me more like Jesus. I'll just sin some more. Okay? I think that's why Paul wrote in Romans 5. Look at it. I want you to see this. Because I want to make clear on something. Because some of you may walk out of here going, well, I'm sleeping with my girlfriend and we're living together and everything is great. And so, hey, God forgive me anyway. And I, he just built my character. No, 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 no. Listen to me. The law was brought in so that the trespass or offense, the sin, may increase. In other words, the pressure, okay? But where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, here's what he's saying. He goes, look, I know you're sinners and I know you're jacked up and I know you're doing this. But listen, when you do that, you understand that sin is covered by the grace of God. And then he asks a question. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so grace may increase? No. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. By no means, he says. Because we are those who have died to sin. Again, you've got to know your identity. We no longer live. For, you have died for sin. So how can we live in it any longer? See, we'll talk about sin in the coming weeks and how sin shapes us and how God will even use sinful men and women in his kingdom to redeem us. Listen, failure's never final long as love exists. But outside of open, unconfessed sin, where there's pain not caused by sin, the truth is Christians have more difficulty handling pain than non-believers. Because you read the Bible, you read the scriptures, and you read the promises of God, and you conclude that your life should be always filled with joy, love, support, and success. Listen, that's reading the Bible selectively. The scriptures state clearly and often that we will see in this series that enduring pain is one of the ways, perhaps the main way, that God works his grace deep into our lives. Look at this statement on the screen. There is no growth without change. There is no change without loss. And there is no loss without pain. You'll grow only to the threshold of your pain. Let me say that again. You'll grow only to the threshold of your pain. If every time a painful situation comes around, that you're not getting your way and you're a blame thrower or you're a blame sponge, then understand you have reached your lid of growth. And you need to revisit the cross, a fresh perspective of grace. You see, the Bible's full of failures. 
And God's response was redemption through Jesus Christ. And we need to make friends with our pain. A recent article in the New York Times by David Brooks was surprisingly biblical. I want to show you this. He says this, look at this statement from, it says, people shoot for happiness, but feel formed through suffering. Happiness wants you to think about maximizing your benefits. Difficult and suffering sends you on a different course. The right response to this sort of pain is not pleasure, it's holiness. Isn't that good? It's not pleasure, it's holiness. Happiness wants you to think about maximizing your benefits. Difficult, difficulty and suffering sends you on a different course, placing the hard experiences in a moral context and trying to redeem something bad by turning it into something sacred. Can I just be honest with you? Some of you in this room, God wants to take your deepest pain and he wants to turn it into holiness. Sacred. And you see in the process, you may not come out healed because that's what we want, isn't it? but you're gonna come out changed. I just gotta be honest with you. I've struggled to share this for six months because it's so personal to me. And I want it for you. I want it for you more than anything in the world. It's your shadow. I want it for you guys that are in high school not to believe the lies of shame and guilt that turn into adulthood. And I want this for you because failure is never final as long as love exists and his name is Jesus. And by the way, look at me. You're fully loved and you're fully forgiven through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he doesn't promise a pain-free life, but he guarantees a meaningful one. And there are gonna be seasons of pain that you're gonna have to work through in my crucible experience, some of our men are going to these crucible weekends and they have a 36-hour crucible experience. Mine lasted about four months. About four months. And what's come out of that for me is to understand all the things that I thought were failures that I've rounded out that story to grace. And I want that for you. So here's what we're gonna do over the next few weeks. We're gonna look at some men and women from Scripture, Old Testament to New, and we're gonna see how God took them through failure and how it wasn't final because Jesus is the answer. So I'd encourage, I know some of your past is, you had your crucible moment, you went through all that, and you're healthy. So you pray for me, okay? But for the rest of us, you bring somebody with you because I really believe God wants to use this to help us round out our story of grace so that we can be healthy and authentic, and live in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. I thank you that failure isn't final. It feels that way. It seems that way. God, I know there's some folks sitting in these rows this morning that right now it feels final. There's probably some folks listening online this morning that the loss feels so deep. God, I pray that they would hear that it's never final as long as love exists and you are love. That Jesus is still alive. He rose from the grave. He is not a failure. He conquered death, hell, and the grave so that you and I could be in fellowship with you, Father and be known and loved. So God, I pray for us over these next few weeks as we wade through some really weighty stuff, that God, we would come out each week knowing that it's not final because of you. Our hope is in you. God, thank you. Thank you for healing. Thank you for change. And God, may you do that across the board for those who are listening and those who are here. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I'll see you next week. 
Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you. I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.